The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chariot. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Welcome to the podcast, Tom Seawit. Tommy, you are a podcaster twice over, uh, and you live on the opposite side of the country from Nathan and I, um, Victoria, British Columbia. Actually, just north of there, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. I'm just on the north end of Campbell River. The north end of Vancouver. Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island. Okay, I was thinking Victoria's an island, right? Nope. Vancouver's uh-huh. the island. Vancouver Island's where Va- Victoria's on. It's on the south end. Campbell River's on the sort of northeastern oh. side. Tom, I failed Canadian geography um, in high school, apparently. <laughs> uh, we did some research on you, and we're super happy to have you on Blurry Creatures. You had a really cool post that I kind of wanted to read to kick things off, to get people to get to know you. Um, and it was a Facebook post of yours, and it, and it goes like this. I'm going to read it. Um, Sitting on the bridge during wheel shift at 3.40, sore hands, back and knee where I wiped out, tripping over deck pens on board. True happiness, though, the things we get to see while traveling the British Columbia coast. Wildlife in brailler baskets full of fish, nets that bubble like a pot of boiling rice from all the salmon screaming underwater. Whales, eagles, and endless horizons with no humans. Sunsets and sunrises painting the skies in amazing colors. Yes, this is the life. Sure sad it's a way of life that may be all but a memory we are fast becoming an endangered species the commercial salmon fishermen oh we are we have i'm 45 years into the industry i was in diapers on commercial salmon sane boats and then when i got out of high school i was expanded into other fisheries throughout the coast and uh, (coughs) i've seen the good i've seen the bad and now i'm seeing the disaster it's just it's 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 unbearable to see that we went up north and we fished and uh, we made you know a wage where we should have made ten thousand dollars or more for the four weeks we fished we made about four thousand dollars if we're lucky and then we came home to vancouver island in the south and there's no anticipated commercial fisheries for sockeye salmon which the americans call silvers or reds and they're calling like 300,000 to return to a river where the average was 9 million fish returning every year. Sometimes up to 36 million would return. And now it's, uh, they're pretty much probably going to list them as an endangered species here soon. And if we don't do something, then extinct species, uh, reds down here, sockeye. Wow. And what, what do you think is causing all that? Too many damn seals and sea lions, too many damn Granola chewing, blinded by concrete dust, seal huggers and sea otter huggers that don't want anything killed. And we have a complete explosion, overpopulation of seals and sea lions from California right up to southeast Alaska. And I'm the president of Pacific Balance Marine Management, which is on Facebook. But it's a provincial, I guess you could say a national push to get license for us First Nations, Canadian Indians to hunt harvest and sell seals and sea lions for everything from pharmaceutical products to meat in the grocery stores and pet stores and furs, of course, for the fashion people that want to wear it. So we're trying to get balance back in our system. And it all correlates to Sasquatch, you know, like if there's no salmon, the Sasquatches are migrating right now from the Alpines down into the creeks, rivers and streams where the salmon spawn is supposed to be taking place. Well, if there is no salmon, what do the Sasquatches and other wildlife have to eat? Nothing for this time of the year. I love it. I love when people just own their belief in Sasquatch and not even own it, but just say they're migrating. 
they're moving. Uh, what what? How do you know they're migrating? Like what what gives you evidence for that? Basically, I went rogue back in the early 1990s. I turned into a rogue hairless human. Basically, like a rogue Sasquatch. <laughs> I got a Revenue Canada, which is your IRS equivalent to your IRS department in the United States, send me a sweet little letter that said I owed one hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars in back taxes. I had no way of paying it. I wasn't about to declare bankruptcy due to pride. So I looked around, and no offense to the listeners and to you two, but well, you got to remember I'm a Canadian Indian. But I said I'm sick and tired of Whitey's world. I'm leaving it. I'm getting off Whitey's radar. And I walked into the bush and I stayed there for nine years. And I came out, you know, I came out to wow. party and spend money I was making out there. I became a grizzly bear hunting guide for his fire club international clients. I lived in a abandoned native village doing native cultural tours to the kayakers and people off yachts and sailboats. I was one of the best Indian seafood poachers the coast ever seen because I would do semi-trailer loads of fish and I never got caught. So it gives me a good ranking. And I was a commercial fisherman. <laughs> and during the winter times, I would go watch logging camps when everyone went home for Christmas and snow season and did it by myself. So basically, I went rogue. And, you know, I was at one time I walked into the bush and I was in there for almost probably close to five months when a helicopter landed and he enticed me with a thermos of coffee and a pack of cigarettes to come close to the helicopter. And when I went there, he said, Tom... It's time for you to come home. People are worried about you. And I was oh, and man. I was so, I, I was apprehensive to go near him. And that's how rogue I'd went. I went total bush and you know, so I know what the Sasquatches are like. And then living out there, Sasquatches are like white bears, white deer, white moose, white whales. You spend enough time in the bush, you're gonna see, smell, or hear them. And they're just feral humans. They're just humans like me that got pissed off with society thousands of years ago and went and lived the more in tune with nature type of existence without greed, envy, hate, because my teachers have told me from Omaha that Sitonga, their Sasquatch, have laws, very strict laws. Yeah. And others that I've spoken to, we have a bridge with some tribe members throughout Sasquatch Island, which is North America, otherwise known as Turtle Island to Indians, but I call it Sasquatch Island because we all have the stories. And there's some of us, some, not me, but some are making that and have been making it for generations, the Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall bridge to the Sasquatches in their regions. And we learn things from them. And that's what I'm doing is bringing that out. It's time for the non-Indian to start learning our ways so they can smarten up and say, no, we can't disrespect them. We can't shoot them. And that's what I'm all about is protecting. Well, I think, sorry to cut in, I, I think that you bring up a good point in there that... A lot of times, like when Luke and I are, you know, we're kind of finding this uh, when we're talking to our friends, there's just so much skepticism. And it seems like in the native culture, it's just, it's it's more, what are these creatures? Where do they come from? There's not this huge emphasis on trying to prove that this thing exists. It's more, how do we help it? How do we live with it? How do we... How do we protect it? Yeah. You know, look what, you know, no offense. Why is that? Why is there this big chasm between... Us down here in the states and and people who live closer to nature. Well, number one, your Bible thumping mercenaries are going to go after them and try to convert them to Christianity. Look at the damage they did to the indigenous people of the Americas, and they're still doing it. The hell they sending missionaries to our reservations for? We don't want to have that book shoved on our throat sideways. They're going to do the same thing with the Sasquatch, and that's why I need to educate the native people and others that no, we're going to have to start, you know. Bible thump them when they try to come after Sasquatch when they are scientifically proven to exist. Because trust me, if they can go to the Maldive Islands with their Bibles off in the Indian Ocean to try to convert those indigenous people that have never technically been bridged with human, modern humans, what's going to stop them from doing it to Sasquatches? And then you got all of our filthy, rotten diseases. Look what smallpox, influenza, tuberculosis, venereal disease, alcohol, and bullets did to the indigenous people of the Americas. That's why I'm trying to educate people to, you know, learn, know your history so you're never destined to repeat its failures. Don't send your missionaries, and please don't send your general custers into the other tribes' territory, the Sasquatches, when they do get conclusively proven to exist. 
Hey Tom, can, can we back up just a second though, just for context here? Um, you're a native, you're a native Canadian Indian from British Columbia. What, what is your tribe, and and can you talk a little bit about that so we can? I know we jumped into it, but I think just for context for our listeners, northeastern Vancouver Island is the Kwakwakiwak Nation. That's what I belong to. We were uh, made up of about twenty three different distinct tribes that all spoke the same language of Kwakwala. And Kwakwakiwak means the Kwakwala speaking people. That's on my father's side. My mother's a full-blooded Cree Indian from central Canada and Saskatchewan. And so I'm mixed blood, but brought up on the coast. But when you research the Kwakwakiwak, otherwise known as Kwagyutl or Kwagyoth, you'll find that we have the greatest connection to the Sasquatch, which we call Chunahwa. Chunahwa was mixed in, uh, lost in translation to come out meaning wild woman of the woods. It actually means like an ogre, a big, the other tribe, the hairy one, the big one. And it's our highest mm. ranked crest. We see it on our totem poles to this day. I have it on my shirt, my one of my designs of Junahwa. And where I am right now in Campbell River, it's a small city with the highest concentration of wood carving and other art depictions of Junahwa and Sasquatch in the world. Right here in most people, when I talk to them in Calm River, they scratch their head and go, dang, I didn't realize that. And I'm like, yeah, look around. Sasquatch is everywhere here. <laughs> yeah. And we've heard a lot about how Sasquatch in different areas of North America are different. The, the farther north you go, we've been told the bigger they are. And the more south you go, they get a little bit shorter. They get a little more animal-like. Do you find that the Sasquatch near you guys are friendlier? What, you know, you were out in the bush for nine years, you said. What, what kind of personal interactions like what was the most mind-blowing interaction you have with these animals the best interaction i had was um i knew i was being probed by uh, two sasquatches uh one was a big footprint which i knew was the big boy that usually hung around where i lived out in the mouth of night's inlet and i told my crew i said we're building these cabins for my tribe i told them i said we're end of September, we're starting to be probed by a Sasquatch, possibly two. There's a smaller track around 14 inches. Yeah. I said, don't be afraid. I said, if you smell something, hear something, just say, yo, Wixas, Majos, Ye, Chodacha. Hello, Sasquatch. I don't know who you are, how you doing. And I said, and just turn around and walk away. I said, everything's fine. And then sure enough, we had a few things happen. And one night I was uh, sitting there and I was having a cigarette outside one of the cabins and my crew partner was inside Facebooking or something. But anyway, I was <laughs> under the front roof and I was having my smoke and it was drizzling and, and I smelled something and I'm like, okay. So I inched along the building and I jumped out and I went, yeah, and there was this juvenile Sasquatch about six foot high and skinny and you know, felt like a teenager. All of a sudden, its eyes went big. It looked at me, and I went, oh, turned, and just poof, disappeared in the bush. <laughs> no way. I was laughing away, and I went into the cabin, told my native partner, he's like, quit teasing the tuna, and they're going to get mad at us. <laughs> <laughs> so the next night, a couple nights later, our garlic was going missing from our kitchen area, which was just in, under a tarp, and we knew it was them taking it. So I put my camo on put my 12 gauge and my 338 out the window and I started crawling out the window and my crewmate goes, what are you doing? I said, whatever happens, don't you shoot with that 3030 until I tell you or you see me. And, and I said, I'm going to go see if I can see that junah. So I crawled out the window and I crawled, but we'd been clearing brush and cutting trees down and raking leaves. And yeah. I strategically made all these piles of leaves to burn in November when the rains come. And this is October. I strategically did it so I could scurry on my belly crawling from berm to berm. And I got behind the, my cabin about 60 feet on the entrance to the trail into the woods where our outhouse was. And I crawled into this pile of leaves and I pulled it over top of me with my camo hat and just a little sliver so I could see and two guns beside me. And I, just as it got dark, that juvenile Sasquatch come out of the bush and it grabbed a tree in it with its left hand and bent down with its right leg off this four foot dirt berm that used to be the old logging road edge. And it's looking at my cabin and all of a sudden from five feet away, I come shooting out of leaves. Yeah. 
And that thing bent that tree and it sprung up and it yelled and there's leaves falling and the tree was snapping and that thing looked at me and just with this pissed off look, it just ah! turned and it sounded like a D8 cat rushing through the bush and then jumped on the leaves <laughs> laughing away and ran back to the cabin. My partner's there with the 30-30. You quit picking on the Sasquatch. <laughs> Why the guns? You know, like it feels like a little contradictory to what I understand. A little bit about how you feel about the creatures. Well, I ain't stupid. So if, <laughs> if, you're I know, selling, but... if you're selling Girl Scout cookies with your daughter and there's a white picket fence all around the house and it says, beware of my pit bull and there's an empty dog house. Do you open the gate and walk to the door to sell your cookies? Hell no. no. That pit bull is going to rip you a new one. Well... In the bush, I will never hunt Sasquatch. I will never go after them. I always carry a yeah. rifle. But in that situation where I was hopefully going to get close to them, what would have happened if that thing went rogue on my butt and tried to rip, lip me, rip me from limb to limb? Well, being yeah, an Indian, exactly. I have a tr- Indian card that says I'm allowed to food, social, ceremonial harvest 365 days a year with no limit. So I can live off the environment. Well, in my philosophy anything comes within a 10 foot radius of me wanting to rip me from limb to limb or rip me a new one it becomes food social ceremonial real quick and gets full of lead well, That's the bush. well, I, well I, my my question really is like have you heard then is have you heard of any like violent encounters because it seems like they're from my understanding they're a little more they're not as as mean and aggressive up in that area but do you find there's stories of them being like that where you need to shoot? Well, we have a woman apparently that was her brother was notified by the police about five years ago that her body was found at a rest stop north of Campbell River on the Vancouver Island Highway. A rest stop that had cement picnic tables, outhouse units, uh, all kinds of stuff. Well, they told her logger brother nor- that. She was found decapitated, her left arm removed, her body pummeled, her clothes intact. She was not sexually attacked. And hmm. they know that it wasn't a bear, a wolf, cougar, or anything natural. They, they figure that a Bigfoot Sasquatch killed your sister. So then a few months later, we have a 16-year-old boy go missing here in Campbell River at the edge of the wood on the north side of town living in a trailer park. Mom said, there's some bears coming in out in the backyard again. I can hear something out there. Oh, it's all right, Mom. I'll go scare it away. Grabs a flashlight, walks down the stairs, goes out the back gate into the wood. Never Mm. seen from again. His posters are still all over Campbell River almost four years later. You know, look at, what's his name with Missing 411. You know, these things, some of those Sasquatches like beans, human beans. Our stories tell about Chonach will take misbehaving children and rub spruce sap from a tree in their eyes so they can't see, put them in a basket and on her back or in a sack she's woven from spruce root or cedar fibers and bring them deep into the forest where she boils them up and eats them. So there's cannibal stories throughout many First Nations and American Indians. We know those some of them like beans, human beans. And it's no different than some of the Pacific Northwest coastal tribes. We had cannibalism out here prior to the European contact. And trust me, I'm a, I belong to the Hamatsa Society. And that's part of that ceremonial ristolics that cannibalism, we don't practice it, but we still have the society. And it's very, very powerful to be a Hamatsa that I belong to. And, you know, in the modern world, I got a few enemies out there. I'd like to boil up and eat. <laughs> you know, it's the giants, right? The giants used to be, be the things to be scared of. And, you know, in fairy tale, they would, they would boil their boil children and eat them. And on that violent side, that's, that's still Sasquatch. That's not a, a different cryptid. It's not a, it's not a werewolf. It's, it's the same hairy, hairy man of the woods or hairy woman of the woods, as, as you said, that, that will not always be benevolent. Well, well because it's in our lore and our culture, you know, there's that trait of it eating misbehaving children. Other tribes speak of it differently, of course. But as an investigator for the last eight years or so, you know, I never was an investigator. I was basically forced because of finding Bigfoot, Renee, you know, her skepticism. I used to almost want to throw my 
wine bottle at her TV screen sitting <laughs> yeah, with my yeah. wife down in Washington State when I came out of Bush a few years back. And I'm like, what do they mean if these creatures exist? Yeah. If there was a Sasquatch? There's no bloody if about it. Those things are out there. I've seen them, smelled them, heard them around me. So I became an investigator. And what I found fine now looking into it and working with uh, Lucas White, the Omaha tribe member, who's a good friend in my uh, Sasquatch Island uh Nebraska chapter president, they have laws, very strict laws. There's four social classes to the Sitonga, the Sasquatch in his neck of the woods. There's harvesters, hunters, scouts, and rogues. Rogues are the male leaders that were displaced from a clan unit. It's nature. Nature's code dictates that the gene pool must always oust one or another one to get into leadership, to spread the seed, to genetically strengthen the wolf pack, or be it a human family or tribe, or even Sasquatch units. So just like when you guys got dumped and the listeners got dumped from a girlfriend, you went rogue for a while. You got pulled yourself into a whiskey bottle and you best way to get under get over one woman was to get under many others you know <laughs> we went rogue <laughs> i've heard about this i've heard about the rogue sasquatch there's all like a lot of people say there's encounters with just one male in the middle of nowhere and that's you know it's just random and i've heard even the land of lakes just north of tennessee someone was telling me that he, they think all the rogues kind of to kind of congregate up there and there's really violent encounters just in the land of lakes in the Kentucky, Tennessee area. And so it's weird, man. You go down these trails and and people not only do they believe, but they have very specific beliefs about what they're doing and, and what they're not doing. Do you think that they migrate up, up and down the coast and they get all over the place? How far do you think these things are traveling? They're staying within territorial boundaries based on high seasonal protein sources and also geographical features. So in other words, you have a mountain with a salmon stream on either side. Will there be a clan unit from my investigations in each river system? Offshore in the islands between Vancouver Island and the mainland, those are where the shellfish beaches are. So the Kwakwakiwak and other coastal tribes would seasonally migrate sometimes up to six different areas of harvest and living each year. The Sasquatch is doing the same. So here in British Columbia, in your winter of January through March, they're in the shellfish zones. And then in March, when the herring comes to spawn, they move to where the spawning is going to take place with herring because they come right in the shallows. You can reach down and grab them and fill a five-gallon bucket in 15 minutes. And then after herring, some of them move up to the head of the inlets to the glacier melt rivers where the ooligan, the candlefish, goes to spawn and turns rivers black. There's so many. And then come the springtime when the big low tides come, some of them will start migrating out to the outer islands and beaches because that's where on the big low tide they can get the abalone, the chitons, the limpets, the shellfish that is now getting green so it's not good to eat. So they have to go to other marine resources in May and June. And then June comes and the berries come and they start following those berries, but a lot of them are following the snow melt up the mountains because they're looking up. And when they see the turkey vultures and the golden eagles coming from down in the United States to Canada, BC, and the gold and the bald eagles up there and the ravens, they know that the snow is melting and it's exposing ungulates, elk or deer or bears or cougar or wolves that died in the winter, didn't get off the mountains quick enough and they succumb to the snows. Now they were in refrigeration all winter and now when the snows recede, there's carrion. Carrion is still in the Sasquatch diets throughout North America. So me being a bushman, commercial fisherman, and the experiences I have, um, look at the whole Sasquatch equation at a different level. And as you guys see, I can tell by your guys' facial features, you guys are going, holy shit, where the hell did this guy come from? He definitely knows a little <laughs> no, bit of no. other stuff on the Sasquatch. I mean, I love it because uh, you, uh, like Luke and I, so we've been trying to build the case on our podcast. We're starting out pretty new from, we had, we both had bigger podcasts and in different realms. And this is something I've been looking into for a long time. And I was really wanting to do a podcast about it. But one of the the major pillars of one of our first episode of belief is sort of all the native American history behind this creature. And it's something you can't deny. It's, it's, I've heard this almost a hundred different names 
for Bigfoot in Native American uh, culture and legend. Is, is that number accurate? Were we right on that or are we wrong? There's 660 some odd tribes in the United States and Canada. So you can so break probably that more than down. 100. There's well over 450 <laughs> names for it. Oh, wow. That's a lot. That's hey, that's great because always better to be a little under than over, right? Yeah. Hey, Tom, so we're talking about, I mean, the terms you're using here were, are very biological. We're talking about, you know. Yeah. Uh, migration and food sources and the way that the, these creatures move with the seasons and with, with the game and then also the carrying and all that kind of stuff. There is a very supernatural um, portion to at least the legend of, of, of Sasquatch and Bigfoot. And there's a, there's a big camp within this Bigfoot community that also believes Bigfoot to be a supernatural being, you know, maybe not biological, but fully supernatural or maybe a mix of the two. From your standpoint, being an Aboriginal person, is there a supernatural element to to Bigfoot, or is this purely a biological creature that is is you know is closely related, as, as you might have said before, to humans, um, but nothing like uh, nothing supernatural, not a uh, spirit or a uh, yeah I don't know a boogeyman kind of thing. What what was your thought on that? Is is because I know the Native American people are very connected to the earth and in, in a spiritual way as well. And, you know, we as humans are spiritual beings, but is there a supernatural element in, you, in your mind or in your, in your worldview to, to the Sasquatch or to when I forget how you, the name you guys have for it. I, I'd probably, I'd flub it to death trying to say it, but <laughs> yeah. is there anything supernatural? Jonah Hua is said to be from the, is one of the supernatural creatures it's because it's so unknown, like Thunderbird right. and Double Door Spin yeah. Killer Whale and uh, Double Headed Sea Serpent. I come across, I come at it from what my experience. It's a critter. It poops, it pees, it leaves tracks, it eats, and it's curious to humans. When people equate the UFO flying, porthole jumping, cloak in mind speaking Sasquatch, the majority of them are on glue or mushrooms. <laughs> so no no experiences with mind speak or anything like that? No, those are people that got so shit scared they pooped in their pants and they all of a sudden they came up with the, their mind kicked in and oh, it cloaked, it jumped through this tree structure and all of a sudden it vanished into smoke and it was reading my mind. Oh, well, come on now, do a few more mushrooms. <laughs> well, I got to push back. I got to push back a little bit because, and I asked about, you know, do you, you know, Luke had asked a question about, do you think it's other cryptids? Is that many people think they're different forms of, of Bigfoot. It's not just one type. You know, you've got some that have, you know, been described to have like wolf like teeth. They like razor blade teeth and they call them Janosqua. And those ones are real aggressive and they'll rip your head off. They have like armor on. They're not like the friendly Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest. So are we, what if some of them can, what if some of them have supernatural powers in the ones and some don't, you know, what about that? I don't know. God's got supernatural powers and who's seen him yet? <laughs> you know, that's the way I look Fair at enough. it. You know, it's, <laughs> Elijah, when, when these people come up with these claims of these, supernatural mind speaking cloaking ufo flying like i say i just laugh and you know and i'm bigfoot without the bullshit so you know well they have good arguments because like humans can kill everything and we can't seem to kill this thing and prove that it exists so it, it seems to have some sort of power supernatural power to avoid us avoid getting shot uh i mean how do you explain that i mean humans are pretty good hunters no you know <laughs> no, we're, we're not. We're, we're bad. We think we are good. That's our problem, our ego, our vanity. So what we have to look at it is to be humble and say, wow, here we are in 2020. I can pick up my cell phone and instantaneously talk to anyone around the world. Wow, that's pretty cool because cool. we can't find Sasquatch. We can't find Sasquatch. We can't find Sasquatch.
I guess I, I'm just not so quick to leave the su- supernatural argument quite just yet. Do you feel like that's a held belief of natives around the United States too, or is it is it different tribe to tribe of what they think these things are, or is it pretty universally you know agreed upon? To my fellow Indians that believe in that supernatural aspects of their other tribe members that they share their homelands with, I totally respect and support what they think. But I can only speak for the region I operate in and for the tribes that have that supernatural aspect. I totally respect and support that. But in most cases, if I'm at a conference or gathering and some native person comes to me, I respectfully say, thank you very much, but I'm needed over here. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to hear it. You know, it's like it's like when a Jehovah's Witness shows up <laughs> at my door. You know, I answer the door bare ass naked, buck naked, and I go shalom. <laughs> you know, shalom. what I'm doing. <laughs> and the whole Native American worldview on this: is, Do you really believe that the Aboriginal people have a special connection with Sasquatch? It sure feels like there's a different connection for Indigenous people. Um, when you talk about that, and maybe what 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 that is, is it just from coexisting in the same place for so long or is there actually a special some kind of special symbiotic relationship that exists that like the rest of us don't have huge number one we feel the ramifications from the negativity that was inflicted upon us as native peoples in canada and the u.s so residential schools uh forced into reservation uh, trails of tears where thousands of tribe members would die being migrated forcibly to an Indian reservation. Uh, missionaries whooping my dad and a sign in school that said, the Queen's English will be the only language spoken in these halls. Anything different will be punished with the cane. I was whooped and beaten the head with a bell and nursery school and a stick in kindergarten because I was using Mm. my language. So we look at that and we look at the other tribe, the Sasquatches that we share our homelands with, and we don't want the injustices, the negativity inflicted upon them. And that's why a lot of us, a lot of tribes are clammed up about it. Um, Les Stroud goes to the Indian village in coastal British Columbia. And out of respect for them, I'm not going to say their tribe name, but tribe members from there, I have, I know more about the Sasquatch in that area than Les learned when (laughs) he was there. Because I'd been there many times as a commercial fisherman. And now with the white man's magic, no offense people, but messenger, I get, Tom, listen to this. 1.30 in the morning as I'm waking up and I'm like, what the (laughs) heck's going on? He goes, I got my phone out my window, man. And Here's a Sasquatch screaming in that native village and many others that I hear about. (laughs) But we don't go out there and, you know, Les went there. He was given a little bit. He was given a tip of an iceberg. You got any nuggets for us? What what are some things that you know that he don't know? He's got to quit wearing too much clothes, bandana on his head, and having all that electronics. They don't uh, like electronics, do they? They don't like electronics. Uh, Lucas down in uh, Macy, Nebraska, he was trying to get close to the Sitonga that was behind these bushes. And uh, he was, every time he tried to get close, the thing would move off until he took his knife out, his money from his pocket, his cell phone and threw it. And then he was able to approach within 60 about 65 feet from the Sitonga in the bushes. How do they know? I mean, I mean, that's a supernatural question. How do they know you got technology? See, concrete. The nose never lies. <laughs> so out here, yeah. I can travel at night, and I can go to a prominent feature on my course, pitch black in an 18-foot aluminum speedboat flying with a 65 horse off the back, light a cigarette, make a 90-degree turn, and go across an open channel. When I get to the cigarette button, I flick it. I grab the throttle because I know it's time now. I'm not looking at a watch. I know that all of a sudden, bang, I'm going to get hit with the smell of the bull kelp or the pop kelp. And I know to slow down or the moss the, and the sphagnum moss. Yeah, the nose, the nose knows, right? Yeah. So they just have these instincts. They have instincts. Look at your dog. Watch your dog, animals, when they lick their nose. There's a reason why animals have a long tongue to lick their nose. They can smell game cams. They can smell cell phones. They can they can smell it all, basically. Try it when you go home. 
lick your fingers, put them in your nose, smell. You'll be able to smell your wife's perfume. If you keep doing it every night, you're going to be able to pick up things. The smell of your dog, the smell of your carrots in your backyard when you open the back door, the smell of your wife before you see her. Moisture. If I'll do it again, but I'll use the other hand. Don't ever make that mistake. <laughs> use a glass of water. Like when you're out in the bush, you always put that moisture in your nose. Same way a dog, grizzly bears, black bears, when they're ready to come trying to laser beam where you are, they're licking their nose. They're getting their follicles so, wet to smell better. But to, to go back to what you were saying before, there's things that you guys keep to yourselves is what you're saying. You don't, the tribes keep it to themselves. They don't like to share this information. There's sort of an inside knowledge on these creatures. Is that is that kind of what I'm picking up? Like, that they're a little bit of trepidation, don't want to, you know, well, I, don't want to share too much. Don't want people coming in their, your areas and stuff like that. So look at the name of your guys' podcast, Blurry Creatures. Why do you think Sasquatch shudders and shakes when he, someone's pointing the camera at him? Why do you think he just turns and vanishes? Why does he just peek at us and not actually come and sit with us at our fires or invite us to come sit with him? They despise us. They loathe us. They pity us. Look what we are doing and what we have done to our environment, their environment. We're the dumbest animal. We'll defecate and urinate where we harvest our food. We will grow our food in human feces. We will pollute and build houses upon where we grow our food and should be growing our food. We're the dumbest critter on this planet. We're destined to doom. Now, all of a sudden, we get sent COVID. You know, wake up. The 100-year present is coming to you. It was Spanish flu last time. It was bubonic plague before and yada, yada, yada. Now we send you COVID, you know. And first thing we did as Native people, that the ones that I communicate with that are having interactions, is we went out where we offer the foods and we go out just before dark and we'd offer the food and we'd break a stick, snap it, something that you could just barely break. And then we'd start coughing and sneezing and retching. And then we grab the food and go back in. And hour after dark, we go out and repeat that procedure. And then just before we went to bed, we'd go repeat it again. So for the ones that have the interactions with their Sasquatches, it was us passing them the message that we hairless humans, we're sick again. Don't come near us. And I know of six places where the Sasquatches vanished. They heeded the warning. My area was one of them. You know, look at us as humans. We're stupid, filthy, and we are going to have a pandemic on our hands here where I'm probably going to have to go rogue and go back into the bush and live like a Sasquatch because, you know, I'm a human. I'm a fighter. Another walkabout. Yeah, Another walkabout, yeah. So I, I know you did an interview about this before, Tom. You, you talked about um, Sasquatch's vulnerability to COVID-19. Can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, we just, we just kind of touched on that, but you believe that, <laughs> that Sasquatch is actually susceptible, right? I'm not laughing because I think it's funny. I just, the whole thing is is humorous but i i totally believe it could be possible sorry didn't mean to laugh at you we know that the sasquatches came to our indian villages with their young and their arms and their sick being dragged and their sasquatch clans were covered in smallpox mm. and the, our chiefs looked at their men and said go into the big house get our people and they came out with their children and their family members covered in smallpox and we those chiefs and looked at the Sasquatches like, we can't help you. We've got the smallpox disease they didn't know about as well. Unbelievable. And the Sasquatches turned and walked into the forest. So when contact started in the Americas, all of the reports about the mountain devils, the uh, Sasquatches, the ape men, and if early newspapers, there was a lot of reports. But then all of a sudden, the numbers dissipate. And then 1967, Roger Patterson, Bob Gimlin film patty and we start to see a bell curve going up steadily with more encounters more reports coming out and it's exploding now in reports not so much because of internet yeah because of the internet but also because there's more so when i was born in 1965 there was less than a thousand kwak kwak walk we're over 8,000 strong now. That's indicative of every indigenous tribe throughout uh. the entire Americas. We've proliferated like bunny rabbits, as too has Sasquatch. And that's why we're seeing so many reports. And in my 
re and investigations were finding subunits in inferior lands between river systems with no clam beaches. I, I love all this stuff. This is the, these are the questions I want to ask. How strong are these things? And then we can talk about a little about the population. In Omaha, in Macy, Nebraska, they have the big elk cabins and they do hunting of turkey and deer down there and quail or anyway, but they have a reefer unit on blocks and that's where they put their animals during the hunting season. Well, you know, the back of semi trailers, that two handles you lift it up and open so the doors open. Well, that one there yeah. is stainless steel. And if you go to Sasquatch Island or your viewers want to email me, I can even send you a picture from my laptop tonight of that bloody. Yeah, you got to send it to You can see us. the edge of the door has been like peeled and that stainless steel handles bent like a J. Jeez. Like that is the first time ever I seen the strength of a Sasquatch. And, you know, but then when you look at the stories, how they just jump off a highway 20 feet. Yeah. Up, you know, they say 45 miles an hour they can run, they think, you know. Well, I've seen them move. They move like when you see that Flash guy from the Marvel comics and that new right. TV movie. That's what it almost looked like. That thing was like zip. It's like the Usain zip. Bolt of Sasquatches going. Yeah, I see 50, someone. 55. See, most people would see that and they would say, oh, it's cloaking. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just moving faster than you can see. <laughs> yeah, so we, we've asked a lot of those questions. These are the ones I always wish, you know, we, we'd get more answers of because people want to know how strong they are. I mean, you're talking maybe 25, 30 times stronger than a man. Well, look at Ape Canyon. It punched that log in that log cabin house in and that big arm re reached in. And, you know, and then when you see, you read the, but then that's one of the things I kind of found funny about the Ape Canyon report. They were at the door, two of them holding it from the Sasquatch getting in. Yet one yeah. Sasquatch was able to punch in a log underneath. See, Dr. John Bindernagel, when he was alive and teaching me everything from 1991 onwards, he always taught me, when in doubt, throw it out. I'm not saying Ape Canyon's BS. I'm just saying that there's a little bit of cloudiness in there. Well, I heard those stories, too, a lot of times. Like, they'll, they'll attack cabins or they'll have, they'll have encounters. It almost sounds like they're doing some kind of bluff charge where they're they're coming in, they're scaring the tar out of you, they're showing their strength, but, they're, but if they could rip a door off, off and get in so many reports of people saying they're at the door and you always think how come they don't just break the door down i don't i don't understand that but it sounds like they're they're just flexing you know i don't know i have no idea but. i totally agree with you i think they're just you know they're having fun like you two right now that's why we got these we like to laugh that's why we got bellies yeah. you know and i think they're oh, yeah. doing the same thing you know oh man as soon as you know all of a sudden that the attack ends the supposed attack ends they're probably sitting there barrel laughing in the bush laughing going welcome you called it off well because i started smelling poop from inside that cabin you know enough's enough we went far enough we think we got them to crap their pants you know everything's got humor and they're feral humans they're humans so to me so they got yeah. humor <sighs> Sorry, I just have so many questions. I don't know if I cut you off, Luke. If you were going to ask something, no, but I, no, no. I'm just enjoy. I'm thoroughly enjoying this over here. Have you seen any, any, uh, any other cryptids? Because um, we've heard, you know, stories of ogre-like creatures up in Canada walking around with clubs and moccasin, like skin, sheepskin boots and weird stuff. Dog man. Have you have you heard or seen any other things besides Sasquatch? We have another creature referred to in Washington State and Southern British Columbia with the Coast Salish people as stick people, the little people. Uh, my language, we call it bukwus. It's about four feet high, covered in hair. It's a keeper of the ghost realm, so it's supernatural. So apparently when you die from uh, drowning, you screwed up. You never listened to your teachings. You screwed up big time. You died. You drowned. Your spirit goes to the ghost world where it's in limbo it doesn't go to heaven i guess like a purgatory but that's where the commander the leader of that the chief of that is bukwus and he's supposed to be skeletal looking covered in hair and a greenish face and every family and tribe has different mm. stories about it but me because i'm an investigator and you know i've, I've always been tommy Ten Thousand questions i want an answer i look at it in the critterist side so of late, I've come to the belief that there's another cryptid out there, 
a little small little one, people like orang pendek maybe he migrated mm-hmm. over from indonesia asia over to bering land bridge and came down into the americas i don't know but we do know there's something small out there and years ago i was i guess early 90s i went into bond sound i was asked to go in and uh, change a uh, waterproof paper on a graph recording the water levels of the salmon stream go in with my speedboat leave the gun in the boat and walk up the creek about maybe, I guess, 400 yards. And then I get to hear this, chah, 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 and the bush is scurrying. And I'm like changing the graph. And I'm thinking, what the heck is that? Doesn't sound like mink. And I don't think it's raccoons. And I'm changing the graph. And I glocked the thing. And I turned. And on the gravel bar was a little human footprint. Well, Wow. I bet you if you went back an hour later, you would have seen this human's footprints 20 feet apart because that's how fast I went 400 yards down to my boat, got the <laughs> hell in it, got out of there. And I think I had bookless around me, uh, you know, some of them. And we even have some pretty good pictures out there in the, in the Bigfoot world. Well, we've heard, we've heard pictures. stories of the little people. Yeah. We've heard stories of the little people. They say, you know, missing 411, that some guys think that those guys are a part of it, taking I, people. It's a... We had an interview too um, with a guy talking about Henry Hudson um, exploring Canada and the Hudson River. And him coming on, on dwarves playing nine pin and drinking. Little guys. Those little guys I want to hang out with. Not so much the ones that are part of the spirit world. I want to go to the ones that are playing bowing and drinking. Well, playing nine pin and drinking, I think old Henry Hudson was the one drinking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to believe. What about the What about the stories of Native Americans and the giants, the literal giants, killing them, putting them in these burial mounds all over the United States and all over those are the uh, Sas- all over those the are place. Sasquatch. So giants and Sasquatch are the same of the same thing. Does he look at the They're skulls? The same thing. Look at the skulls. So if you when in doubt, throw it out. What I always look at is the distance between the bottom of the nose and the teeth or the upper lip the philtrum area that's a philtrum but the philtrum area if it's very pronounced to me that's a sasquatch so the smithsonian one this is the double rows of teeth six finger giants because i've you've been listening to the queen of the woo woo that cat whatever her name is no no i said she i went on her, oh, on her Carol podcast Baskin? No, Carol her name's Cat something. I was on her podcast. Though. I was on a podcast and she oh. came on. And I had to tell her she's so full of shit. Her eyes are brown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Uh, yeah, there's. I mean, no, I'm talking about the, you know, the giants of, uh, they're described as six fingered, double rows of teeth, red hair. Kind of look like. Have any know. stories or any skeletal remains in my neck of the woods? Well, I mean, it's more historical, you know, passed down stories and stuff because they were supposedly killed off at some point. Yeah, you got to remember, uh, my area of British Columbia was, if it wasn't under ice during 5,000 years ago and beyond, the water tables were 120 feet lower. So if there's any remains of giants in my region, it's not going to be at present sea level and up because this would have been all high level. It will be Ah, out submerged 100. Like if you look at Google Earth and you look at British Columbia, you'll see the ancient riverbeds going offshore some 400 miles. I commercial fished out there for black cod and halibut. I know about those trenches. And then all of a sudden side sonar Google Earth comes out and I went, hey, Someone found our fishing grounds. We used to fish those trenches. We knew those. We had them marked out on charts, and they correlate to Google Earth. So that's where the ancient villages are. What we're seeing up here on coastal regions was alpine. What we're seeing from Central North America, where the mounds are and the giant, supposed giant skeletons and things like that. No, absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, Earth's been occupied for far longer than what we want to believe at this point yeah it's fascinating yeah so no dog man encounters no werewolf creatures nothing here nothing like that Just up there the little people and then of course sea youth the double-headed sea serpent people are still seeing uh, uh, uh dinosaur type flippered animals swimming around oh yeah there's uh there's supposed to be one in lake lake, lake okanagan right they're in uh, bc ogopogo yeah, so the reason why I think it's double headed is you watch rattlesnakes and when they do the mating ritual, they'll entwine yeah. male and female. 
And I speculate that one of my ancestors from the Kwakwakiwa saw two of them entwining their neck. And that's where the double handed oh, sea serpent came from. So I, I don't know what just, they're. He just, mm, yeah. Yeah. He just barged but, in on an intimate moment of some sea creatures. Sea sex. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the experiences you've had with Sasquatch have not been all that scary. You, you, you tell, you recount stories of like, you know, scaring juveniles and, is there like a benevolence there? Do you, I mean, I know there's a respect there, obviously for their, we talked about their strength and their size and their abilities. And is it because they're more human or what, what is it about a Sasquatch? At least from what I'm gleaning from this, that maybe inspires less fear than more fear than, than you would have in leading a, a, a grizzly bear hunt. Only a fool will not be afraid. And there's no such thing as an atheist in the storm. And I've been commercial fishing for 45 years. I've seen many men praying in the <laughs> toilet, I tell you, <laughs> in the storms. Yeah. So every time I have an encounter with a Sasquatch, yeah, you can feel your heart pounding. You can feel your legs shaking. You can feel your throat going dry. It's one of the most intimidating moments you'll ever experience. And that's why I like the chase. I love that adrenaline rush. Makes you right. feel carpe freaking diem, boy. Yeah. You can go to bed happy mm. that night. Feel alive. But, but it is scary. <laughs> like when I was in Macy, Nebraska, staying in those cabins, there's 11 small cabins in Big, Big Elk Park for the Omaha tribe and just half a mile from the Missouri River. And I didn't have a gun. And I'm staying in there at five o'clock. Mm. I'd watch the mm. workers, three workers jump in their vehicle and drive five miles to Macy. I was all by myself in Timbuk frickin' nowhere, Nebraska, along the shores of the Missouri River with Satongas all over where they got an 11 o'clock at night to a seven o'clock curfew for the native people not to go on the street because that's the time of the Sitonga. Well, the air conditioner is going because it's 97 degrees and it's sticky hot. And I'm not used to that from the coast. You know, it's rain, it's liquid sunshine we get out here. And I'm reading yeah. my book, and all of a sudden, you just smell Missouri mud and the smell of a sour, rotten street person multiplied by 25 to 50. A Sitonga walked Ugh. by my intake of my air conditioner. And I'm just like, book down. Okay, what do I got here? Because that <laughs> bug, and because when I got in the cabin, I kid you not, there was plywood and other things barricaded against the windows in this cabin. And the other cabins I went to look at because they weren't locked were the same. And I'm like, what the heck's going on here? Well, now I'm figuring out why the windows are barricaded and they got mattresses up against them and all that. These Sitongas are probing the cabins at night. So I'm sitting there and then all of a sudden you hear kabang against the back of the tin sheeting on the cabin. Kabang. Three times kabang. And I'm sitting there standing on the table in the cabin, which is all sheeted in the aluminum. And I'm getting not even a bar on my cell phone. And I'm, finally, I get a bar and I phone the native guide who's supposed to be with me. I'm like, you get down here with that car right now. And he got down there and I told him what's happening. So he stayed with me. And yeah, I was scared because I not didn't bad. know what those Sitongas are like. And then all of a sudden, the second night or a couple nights later, the same thing happens. But this time it's more aggressive. The rock throwing, the walking by the air conditioner now goes like half a dozen times and I'm just like oh Jesus what do I got I got a knife I got a Bic lighter and I got bug spray okay Bic lighter bug spray got a flamethrower <laughs> knife I'm taking eyes out or I'm taking what I can and it was so bad that when I'm talking in the day to people doing this uh, tourism survey for the tribe for two weeks as I'm doing my contracted job during the day I'm also getting all the Sasquatch stories seeing houses with a mean dog chained yeah. to all four corners and motion lights all around the house people who have cleared hills uh, hill top of a house is a top of a hill is a house and all around it for 200 yards there's no trees because of the Sitongas and people all have buckets or putting Man. waste food out the back door into the bushes to feed the Sitongas so they don't bang on their houses or smash their vehicle windows. That's how scared the people are of Sitonga there. So I'm like, they, like I'm bait out there, man. I'm going to be on missing 411 here if I don't <laughs> yeah. get a gun. They're like, hey, the new guy, the new guy will bring him in. So, so get this. Man. I tell I'm, the 
Indian guide who I fired that day. Anyway, he's we're driving into town and he goes, oh, there's my cousin, the police officer, tribal police officer. So we, I said, I want to talk to him. So I pull up to him. I tell him what's going on down at the cabins. He goes, uh, where are you going? I said, to the band up tribe office. I'm getting the chief is giving me a pickup truck because of the Sitongas and I'll have it now to use, at least get out of there. And he goes, okay, I'll meet you down at your cabin in 15 minutes. That tribal police officer shows up at my cabin, gets out of his cruiser, unbuckles his belt, takes off a 40 caliber pistol, puts it on the picnic table and goes, I'm going to give you this. You're a Canadian that shouldn't is not supposed to have a pistol in the United States, especially on our <laughs> Indian Reserve. I would rather do paperwork and why you had to discharge it instead of having to go look for you, but we won't find you. <laughs> and I'm like, uh. cool, but you only give me one clip. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, right. Gives me the other four. <laughs> I had that under my gun. A police officer gave that to me. You know, yeah, that's how bad yeah. Sitongas are in Omaha and the Omaha yeah. Indian Reservation. So yeah, I it's was crazy. Scared, yeah. You know, yeah, man, man, Tom, this is awesome. We could talk all day long. We're, we try to keep our shows around an hour, but uh, man, you want to uh, you want to plug anything you're doing for our listeners and uh, how, how they can find you and hear more of these stories? Basically, Facebook group, Sasquatch Island, that's the one I'm on. Um, I also okay. am a member of Monster X Radio, monsterx.com. Um, you can go listen to my podcast, a subscription one called Sasquatch Island. I've got all kinds on there. YouTube, I have Sasquatch Island and Seasons of the Sasquatch, both channels you can go to, watch all my videos, and don't forget to... Uh, slap that subscribe button like a rogue sack swap slaps a disrespectful human upside the head so that you can <laughs> watch more of my shows share everything of course you know mox and telegraph share 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 so other people know about me and as you can tell i'm bigfoot without the bs i like to have fun what i'm doing come on an expedition with me i do expeditions in washington state and in vancouver island canada you can go to SasquatchIsland.com yeah. and I'll bring you out. And if you're not a believer, I'll make you poop your pants. Sasquatch will help me. <laughs> Nate, Nate, come, I mean, come on. Yeah, but, dude. Yeah, not a better reason to go uh, to go to America's Hat in the Great White North and uh, see our friend Tom. Maybe well, with see the COVID, Sasquatch. come to Seattle. I live 50 minutes from the airport. I can take you 20 minutes from our condo, and it's on like Donkey Kong up there. Sasquatch is all over. We can sneak across the uh, border too. Let's make a night of it, huh? <laughs> yeah, I got to I got to update my uh, my passport. I'm ready to go. Well, that's Man. what I'm saying. Washington State. You guys are in the U.S. Yeah. I live in Dude, Washington. We, I State. I want to come to Canada. I want to pay twice twice the amount I, I should for beer. Let's make this happen. <laughs> it's because it's real beer. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. I love all you pros. See so many Sasquatch. It's not even funny. It's great. Actually, I've only seen them seven times. That's it? Yeah. I've had seven close encounters. I've heard them and smelled them and knew they're around numerous times. But, you know, they're just like cougars. Vancouver Island has the highest concentrations of cougars. And I've seen one on the island in 55 years. Go figure. Wow. You're talking about like, like, yeah. like cats, not the overly aggressive middle-aged women, right? <laughs> I got one of those. Very <laughs> true. Oh, uh, Tom, you're great. You're a great man. Funny, funny, uh, funny stories. Good storyteller. Appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, thanks so much, Tom. Telling us about some blurry creatures. If you see those little people, and stay away from those. Don't want to go near them. I don't want nothing to do with those ones. They're bad juju. Those ones. <laughs> don't forget to send me a link yeah. so I can post it on all my groups so other people can know about blurry yeah. creatures. Yeah, we'll Yeah, I like you too. You guys yeah. got a good deal going. Keep it up. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate, Appreciate your time, it. man. Thanks for thanks for coming on. Yeah. yeah, and send us that photo of. Uh, you said you were going to send us a photo of that trailer. Yeah, I'll, got ripped yeah, open. I'll go have a. Yeah, I'll go have a smoke and a pee, and I'll come in and do that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Tom, you're All a right, good buddy. man. You are a good man. We're gonna come find. We're gonna come find uh, Sasquatch with you. Oh yeah, Nate, if your listeners Nate. want me on again, come on. I got more stories. All right. We'll all right. Have to bring it back. We'll do it. Yep. Okay. I'll talk to y'all all later. Right. Thanks, Be safe brother. out there in the investigations, people. Alaculus, lot. Go in peace. Thanks. All right. All right. Be good. Be good time. See ya.
really interesting to no, honestly, man, like to run the gamut here and talk about like the difference between Duke and Tom and and where they sit on the spectrum, right? We talked about this in the very beginning of everything in the five pillars and trying to understand and kind of make make what what is of you know is this is this thing purely like a spiritual or a supernatural thing or is this an actual biological animal and you know just in a few weeks here of us doing sort of beginning this journey we've found people that land on both far ends of that spectrum and i think it's fascinating man it's like yeah right it really is fascinating like you have this very native aboriginal person that's like this is a real thing these are like people they just decided to yeah. stay in the woods and went on you know he loved rogue rogue is his word they love to go they're just rogue people that just decide to stay out there and then you've got duke and he's talking about portals and things and things disappearing <laughs> and then and also talking about native people like in the in the southwest that talk about giants living on their side of portals and so you have this mix of like a gamut of not only just the aboriginal people and, and their view of this creature and where it falls in that spectrum but then sort of the modern day look at like you would hope to be an objective look at this where I try to come from an objective standpoint and saying, you know, we'll try to figure out what this is. Like is, I don't know where I land yet, man. It's almost like the more you go, the weirder it gets and the more confused you get. And I think with this subject, you know, you, you, you start out, you think you know a few things. You watch a couple of documentaries. You got it in your mind. Oh, I know exactly what these things are. I can't believe everyone else doesn't see this. But then you start hearing the weirder stories, and then you hear weirder stories, and then you start going, man, I have no idea. But it is interesting, though, that his perspective is totally different than somebody who lives uh, a couple states away. Yeah. The downplaying of the supernatural was a little interesting to me on this one. Like, pretty adamant that that's not what it is. Anyone who says there's a supernatural experience is doing drugs, mushrooms. Well, he, poops. He, he poops, he eats, he pees, you know. I mean, yeah. I'm convinced that like I wasn't I was I wasn't expecting that to be honest. No, that, that no, me neither me because I, I there is so much I feel like with with the with the Aboriginal and Native Native cultures that that delve into the spiritual right into the spirit realm and into these things that that walk between yeah between the lines of but like he said, 650 different tribes in North America. Sure. So so I mean, to, and we're not painting with well, a broad brush. I'm just. This is why I love this podcast because it's just going to get weirder. And it's going to get harder to understand. <laughs> Let's get weird, man. And there's going to be more blurry creatures, and you're going to get more confused. I mean, I'm a decade into like reading about this stuff, listening to this stuff, and nothing blows my mind. But you know what's cool? You know what I thought was cool at the end? Tom's like, "Yeah, you guys got a good thing going here." Here's the thing, you know, we someone like that, someone like Tom, who's so well versed in this topic, it's cool to be able to talk to someone with all those experiences. And be able to to carry the conversation and to keep going and him have a good time because there's a lot of people who try to dive into this topic and it's just they don't know what to do they don't know what to say and it's va- it's, va- it's a little validating too actually too because you start a show you start talking about Bigfoot you don't know how it's gonna yeah, go you, don't. you don't know you still don't know you don't how know it's people go right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know if people are like all right don't go on that show with those guys they don't know what the heck they're talking about you know yeah and I'm at the point man this is I'm open let's talk about it like let's 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 put it out there and I. I don't want to make any any conclusions or decisions for anybody else but myself. And I guess yeah. it's fun. Like let's lay, let's lay that. We talked about it in the very first episode. Let's 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 get a look at all of this as as if we were laying out a case in court. It, what's interesting about doing a podcast is you have to begin be, get get good at asking questions, and you have to be an active listener, and kind of be a journalist too. You know, you're writing a story about something. You can't bring your cognitive bias into sure. the story you have to try and ask the questions because there's a lot of times i'm like asking these questions I'm like i don't know i mean i don't know if this goes against what i believe on the inside but i gotta ask it you no. know right and then i mean even a little pushback and, that, and i think that's good though like i think i think just a little bit because i i'm all about letting somebody go and talk about what they believe in and, and the things and the experiences they've had yeah. uh, but i do appreciate like a couple times you push back saying well i don't know like maybe there is some spiritual thing this because there's other tribes and other people out there that They've had experiences they can't explain that they would they would consider to be a supernatural experience. So, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you have to lay it all out there, and that's all, that's what I'm here for. I, honestly, I'm here for the, for laying it all out there, and and let's let's see where it all lands. And well, you having fun, Luke? I oh, am, yeah, man. Tom's 
Tom was awesome. I don't know. I, I want to have like a, a beer. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to smoke a cigarette. All with these guy, guys but, are I great. Mean, yeah, let's. <laughs> Imagine sitting around the bonfire with like twenty five Bigfooters. It probably. I mean, it sounds fun to hang out with, man. Like I'll hold, I'll hold, I'll hold the the you know the thirty out six. I'll hold the thirty out six while he tries to scare <laughs> scare the juvenile Sasquatch. I mean. I know that's crazy, man. Keep me in the, keep, imagine keep me in the cabin, man. I'm not I'm not trying to. <laughs> you got to have some cojones, some some mangoes to jump out and scare a juvenile Sasquatch. I'll tell you that. That's where I'm gonna end this right now. Like tip my hat to you, Tom. You're you're a bigger man than I would. I'd be. I'd be hiding in the in the cabin. And I'm just and I'm saying this, Nate. Like we we literally have to get ourselves to Montana to see Duke. We gotta get ourselves to British Columbia to see Tom. Because I'm telling you, I mean I'm I'm gonna remain on a skeptic on the outside, I think, until I can, you know, have some kind of experience. And these guys are these guys are <laughs> saying they can they can make it happen. It's, hey, I'll promise you this. First time I see a Sasquatch, I hope you're there next to me, Luke. Right. Me, you, Jose Canseco. And we somehow. <laughs> well, thanks for listening to our show, Blurry Creatures. Uh, if you can, go rate us on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app. It's really important. It's really helpful. Give us a five-star review if you if you love what you're hearing. Help us get up in the charts and get more people listening to this show and keep us going. And th- yeah, and that's honestly the best way you can support us is to, is to go and review the show. That's, uh, that's how the algorithm works. And Nate and I love love doing this, and you can really help us um, help us help you. We're, we're going to continue uh, diving down the proverbial rabbit hole. Uh, I'm Luke Rogers, and I'm Nate, and this is Blurry Creatures. Send us an email, blurrycreaturespodcast at gmail dot com. Make sure you add Nate on Friendster. <laughs> add me on Friendster. <laughs>